I hope you're all at home safe and healthy. To kick off the lecture this afternoon, I'd like to pass it to Admiral Chatfield for her remarks. Ma'am. Hello, good afternoon. I am so excited to be able to resume the Issues in National Security lecture series. Thank you all for taking a chance and coming online this afternoon. Uh, I can't wait for our presenters to start. Uh, Professor Johnson Fries, Professor Smith, thank you so much for being here. Um, and uh, my husband, David, who will be joining me shortly, and I are just so excited and so pleased uh, to start this event today. Oh, and here comes David now. All right, fantastic. Uh, we are all ears. Thank you very much, Admiral David. Good to see you. I'm uh, Professor John Jackson, the series coordinator, and we're planning to offer a new lecture each Tuesday afternoon between now and the 2nd of June. I encourage you all to attend. Uh, you may notice a change in me. I am now competing in the Ernest Hemingway lookalike contest, but uh, we'll let the hair grow for a while here yet. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce two of our uh, most productive professors here at the Naval War College who are gonna give us a, a great discussion this afternoon. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Dr. Don Joan Johnson Fries, who is a university professor teaching national security affairs here at the college. She currently holds the Charles F. Bolden Jr. Chair of Science, Space, and Technology. She is the author of seven books on space security and testified before Congress on space policy topics on multiple occasions. She also teaches classes on women, peace, and security at Harvard University's summer and expansion, extension schools. And her latest book is Women, Peace, and Security, an Introduction, and on that topic. Our second presenter will be Dr. David Smith, an associate professor of sociology in our College of Leadership and Ethics here in Newport. He's a trained military sociologist and social psychologist. His research focuses on gender, work, and family issues, including gender bias and performance evaluations, dual career families, military families, women in the military, and retention of women. A former Navy pilot, Dr. Smith is co-author, author of the forthcoming book, Good Guys, How Men Can Be Better Allies for Women in the Workplace. He's also co-author of Athena Rising, How and Why Men Should Mentor Women. Uh, during the presentation, you can use the chat feature on Zoom to submit your questions, which the speakers will entertain at the conclusion of their remarks. And following our presentation, there will also be about a 30-minute family discussion group meeting on topics unrelated to the uh, lecture topic. So to lead off our discussion, I turn the digital podium over to Dr. Johnson Free. Thank you, John, and thank you, Admiral, for allowing us to try this out. It's, it's a fun experiment. Um, it's my pleasure to talk to you this afternoon about women in national security. It's a topic I'm always interested in, but it's especially timely right now in this being the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in the United States and the 20th anniversary of the passage of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, known as the Women, Peace, and Security Act. And I'm going to focus on, on the Women, Peace, and Security Act and lead it over to a discussion on mentorship that my colleague, Dr. Smith, take. I think we need to, it's important to begin by talking about the breadth of what we mean when we say women in national security. It's, it's, you often think first about more traditional security roles, uh, women in the military, women in intelligence, women as diplomats, um, members of Congress and parliament. But it's important that we recognize as well that uh, human security issues, those which are important, not government to government, but to individuals come into play as well. Health, education, food, economic prosperity, um, members of the press and editors also fall within the national security realm. I think we've been really, um, the role that women play as in national security as healthcare workers has certainly been brought to our attention uh, lately with, with COVID-19. And then there's the question of what exactly are we talking about when we say women's issues? And I'm always um, a little 
puzzled when people ask me that because I think um, Atafete Yayaga, the former president of, of Kosovo, put it very well when she said, uh, the security of women is the security of the country. So there aren't very many issues that aren't women's issues. So women national security is a very broad uh, encompassing topic. So I'm gonna narrow it down and focus on what the, the Women, Peace and Security Resolution 1325 tried to do. It really had two primary components. The first was to bring more women into conflict prevention, mitigation, and peace building. And the idea was that they bring different information, different perspectives, different interests, styles, and, pro and problem solving. Um, in terms of different information, there's a great example that a woman named Valerie Hudson, who works a lot in this field, put in one of her books. She talked about peacekeeping, uh, peace talks, uh, peace negotiations in Sudan a few years ago, and that the men and around the table had been arguing for weeks about who would get possession of a riverbed. And a woman who was pouring water for the men interrupted and said, it might be helpful for you to know that river dried up about two years ago. Um, women live in these conflict zones and they bring information that, that isn't always available to others. They bring perspectives. Um, Valerie Hudson, calls the relationship between men and women the first political order. And another researcher, Mary Capriati, has, has taken that further and shown that relationships, gender equality relationships between men and women tie over into national security, that violence breeds violence. If, if there's inequality in gender relations, um, including domestic violence and violence uh, used as a weapon of war, uh, gender violence used as a weapon of war, it carries over that violence becomes the default method of problem solving. So women bring different things to conflict prevention, mitigation, and peace building. That's the first part of 1325. The second is an acknowledgement that gender perspectives matter, that policies affect girls, women, boys, and men differently. And the best example I can give you of that is the World Health Organization and the Food and Agriculture Organization gathered statistics um, on, on the way food aid is given, food aid is distributed. And in many countries, women are the primary agricultural workers. But in some of these same countries, they are not allowed to own land. And if, if aid is given only to landowners, they might not use it in ways that maximize its, uh, its utility as the workers would. They estimated that if aid were given to those working the land rather than just landowners, output could be raised by 30%, reducing world hunger by 17%. So there's this idea of bringing more women in and acknowledging these gendered perspectives. The, their premises have been backed up by a growing body of evidence. Peace agreements where women are involved um, have a 35% higher possibility of lasting at least 15 years or more because they do bring in these different perspectives. Um, on average, countries that have gender quotas for elected officials uh, spend more than 4% more on social welfare programs for families than those without. Um, countries with large gender gaps and fewer rights for women tend to have more corruption, more violence, more disease, and a lower life expectancy. So there's lots of global evidence for the utility of bringing women into national security affairs very broadly defined. So what about here in the United States? Um, in the United States, after 1325 was passed, it was up to individual countries to come up with national action plans. And to be honest, it took the United States quite a while, a decade to write their national action plan, 2010-2011. Uh, it was updated in 2016. But then the United States took a real leap forward in 2017 by being the first country to pass the Women, Peace, and Security Act, making it the law of the land 
that the agenda be forwarded within, um, within all realms of government work. From there, a strategy was developed, a national level strategy for implementation, and Ivanka Trump presented it to Congress in 2019. Where we're at now is each agency is then left to develop an implementation plan of the strategy. Um, the Defense Department was to have their strategy in in September 2019. Unfortunately, we're still waiting for it. But there is, again, a lot of movement um, in other agencies and within DOD at, at, at different component levels. The implementation issues with women, peace, and security, the things that have held it back are both structural and cultural. And the structural ones are, are luckily for us, mostly found in um, developing countries. There are things that, for example, keeping women from voting, from owning land. Um, but we, we've gotten, for the most part, uh, done away with those structural barriers here in the United States and certainly allowing women in all uh, areas of, of the military as an example of doing away with those structural barriers. The cultural barriers are sometimes harder to overcome. Um, sometimes they stem, quite frankly, from bias and prejudice. And it's not just here, it's everywhere. I was recently in Japan giving lectures on this topic. And it was at a time when it had just been uh, revealed that the University of Tokyo Medical School had been deliberately changing the application scores of women, lowering the scores to keep them out um, with the rationale that they were just going to get married, have children and leave, therefore why bother with their education? And those kind of things are, are still prevalent in many different areas. Cyber, for example, there are zero job vacancies in the cyber field. In fact, it's estimated that there will be 3.5 million unfilled cyber jobs by 2021. Yet women still make up only between 11 and, and 20% of the cyber jobs, even though there are a high number of unemployed women in the field. It's been seen as a traditionally um, male-dominated area. So it's this getting over the idea that there are different areas for different men for different genders. Sometimes too, it's just an, uh, what we call blind fish. Um, blind fish being one fish says to another fish in an aquarium, so how do you like the water? And the other fish says, what's water? If you've never experienced a problem, you've never been in an environment where there's a problem, it's just not recognized. The Chicago Council on World Affairs and the New America Foundation did a uh, studies about two years ago and found that they did a study of security practitioners and found that under 20 percent had any knowledge of the Women, Peace, and Security Act and even fewer really felt it was important to bring women into uh, in national security affairs. So there's a lot of learning to be done and personally I think a first step in that is awareness and one of the reasons I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to this venue and, and other venues, because I think awareness is a huge first step. So then that brings to the question of how do we get more women in positions? And there's a difference between having a role model and, um, and really someone in a, in a leadership position. And research has basically found that there are three different traits that men rely on to get hired promoted and for retention. And those are competence, confidence, and mentorship. That these three areas also apply to women, but often very differently. Competence, for example. Um, Michelle Flor and I, who of course we all know has held a, um, the highest position in the Pentagon of a woman, has said that women need not just to be competent, but hyper-competent, but to be careful not to show it. If you show it too much, it can be seen as threatening. And you pay what she calls a, a gender tax that comes with stereotypes in terms of what women can and can't do in terms of capabilities. So competence is, is required. The second is confidence. 
Um, a, lot of, a lot of studies have shown that men in leadership positions say, well, women don't have the confidence that needed. And the difficulty in that is very much tied to competence. A few years ago, uh, Professor Jackson mentioned that I work a lot in space security. A few years ago, I was at a, a meeting where there was a panel on women astronauts, and they were from very different cultures. There was an American, a Canadian, a South Korean, and a Chinese uh, astronaut, all women astronauts. And when it got to the Q&A, someone asked, what's the hardest part of being an astronaut? And the Canadian astronaut raised her hand and she said, I want to answer this. Please let me answer it. And she said, the hardest part is having to prove my competence day after day after day to my male colleagues. And all the other women on the panel nodded vigorously. Now, these are astronauts. You would assume that their competence was just acknowledged and recognized. But when it's not, it can, it can um, eat into confidence. So competence, confidence, and mentorship all come into play. And in the Navy, as I've been researching this, I found there's a term sea daddy, this acknowledgement, kind of this idea that you get mentored and as your mentor advances, you are brought along, um, that they recognize your merit, they recognize your competence, your confidence. But women don't mentor the same way men do, don't have the same expectations, and don't have the same opportunities for mentorship. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to David because this is his area of expertise. All right, well, thank you, Joan. And I really appreciate um, you setting that up very nicely. And, and really the, the big picture overview, I think, of women in national security is so foundational to um, our broader security and what we need to be doing in terms of of really integrating this into how we how we look and focus on national security and these aren't just women's issues right these are leadership issues and that's one of the challenges i think we have so i'd like to bring this down to the organizational level for just a minute and then think about how why this is important and what are some of the challenges we have in terms of moving this out of making gender inequities in particular not so much a women's issue as it is a leadership issue so if we look at organizations, we know the research shows us over and over again that the more gender diversity, and this applies to other aspects and demographics of diversity as well, the more gender diversity you have at every level of leadership, not just at the lowest levels, all the way through to the top, that the better decisions we make, right? If you measure your bottom line uh, in terms of profits and losses like corporate America does, guess what? They make more money as well out there. You're more innovative, you're more creative, you're more effective. In the national security world, we find higher mission completion rates, right? So the evidence continues to pile up in just about every industry out there on the effectiveness of having gender diversity to every level of leadership. Yet we still find that women are excluded in a number of ways, right? They're still under-recruited, under-retained, under-advanced, and certainly underpaid, as we, as we know the gender pay gap is still one of the, the largest ones out there today. Um, but when you, it's interesting when you ask leaders, and in particular men, about why is this the case, men often will give you a host of reasons about why, why this might exist out there. And, and one of them is that, well, you know, we've already, we've already spent all our time and energy on uh, creating gender equity and integrating women and getting them at the highest levels. I mean, just look, uh, look around. We have a woman on our C-suite. We have a woman in our senior leadership team. And, and that seems to justify in their minds the fact that, well, we're, we're beyond this. But the reality is that if you go out and you ask um, organizations that like Harvard Business did recently, where they asked 800 executives across industries out there, are you including women in the the most important decisions your company makes on a daily basis. And when you ask the men that question, these, these senior men, 92% of them are going to tell you that, yeah, absolutely we are. We're including women in all the important decisions our company makes. Yet when you ask women, 82% of the women will tell you that they still feel excluded in one way or another from in their organization. So we have, we have a gap, right? And we have this uh, gap in terms of, of how we perceive the problem and how we see the problem. And that's one of the challenges in particular with gender inequity is that we don't see the problem in the same way. Um, yet there's still, there's other men out there who believe that, 
well, yeah, there is a problem out there, but maybe it's not my role. It's not my place because it's a women's issue. Again, back to gender and, and it's being a women's issue that it's not my place to be involved in this. But that's why it's important that we make this a leadership issue. The really interesting thing is that Boston Consulting Group did some research a while back and it shows that when men are engaged in gender diversity initiatives in particular, that companies are, are so much better off in terms of accomplishing their diversity and inclusion goals. Uh, yet when men are not, there's very little movement they see in the company in particular. So there's a lot of great evidence to support the fact that we need to engage men and show men that they have a role in doing this in particular. So mentoring uh, was one place, and I'm gonna use the term sponsorship probably off and on as well. When I say sponsorship, I'm not talking about the sponsorship that we often talk about in the military. Uh, I'm talking about the advocacy component, about how we advocate for others out there and pushing them forward for opportunities and jobs and, and things like that. So if I use that term sponsorship, that's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. And it's interesting that you know, we, we do mentoring and sponsoring a little bit different. And oh, by the way, sponsoring and advocacy is a sub-function or a component of great mentorship. So Dr. Johnson Fries brought up the fact that in, in terms of how we look at in the military, we have this term in the Navy we call the sea daddies. And, and I'll just tell you that I, I love that term because I used it with, my, with one of my female mentors uh, from grad school. I was introducing her to the concept of what it meant to be a mentor. And I said, yeah, in the Navy, we would call them sea daddies. So I guess that makes you my sea mama. And she just loved that it, kind of an endearing term. And she still uses it to this day when we have conversations about this. But it's really important to think about, in particular, how we do mentoring just a little bit different. And we all know the advantages of mentoring, right? So we've all, we're, we've all ex succeeded to certain levels of leadership in our organizations out there. And we've all had probably had lots of mentors out there that have helped us along the way. And, and certainly organizations benefit from that, from both an organizational commitment perspective, organizational identity perspective, retention and advancement, succession planning, it goes on and on. The great benefits of mentoring are, are well represented. What's interesting is that women, <clears throat> while in some cases are perceived to be receiving as much or more mentoring, or sometimes even uh, as Sylvia Ann Hewlett said, they are often over mentored compared to men. They don't receive the same uh, type of mentoring that men do. In particular, they're missing some of the psychosocial functions in terms of affirmation, feeling like you belong, the emotional support aspect. Um, and they're also not getting a lot of the advocacy component, right? And this is important because these are the opportunities that help us to advance and move up into the senior leadership levels and show us the path to success out there. Yet, what's interesting is when we did our research for Athena Rising, we found that women who had male mentors were more likely to have raises, more likely to have promotions, more likely to make more money, more career eminence, all the great things out there. So there is something fundamentally different about when men are mentoring women. The question of course is, well, is it that men are better mentors than women? Absolutely not. Um, it's the fact that men tend to be more likely to be in positions of power and influence, those stakeholder positions where they can open the doors. If they're using their social capital and expending it on their mentees, they're gonna go further and do those kinds of things out there. So the other question we often get from guys though is, well, wait a minute, why can't, why can't women just mentor other women? And, and that's a great question. And it, it really comes down to a numbers game. And certainly in a lot of traditionally male dominated industries out there today, if you look at it, we're doing a great job of recruiting, the military included, recruiting diverse talent into our organizations today. Um, so lots of women coming in the front door in particular, right? Um, but there aren't as many senior women in the higher ranks. And it's not fair to, for example, ask the president of the War College to, to mentor all the junior women at the, at the War College, right? She just doesn't have enough time in the day to do that, even if she wanted to do all of that. And she has a daytime job, oh, by the way, right? And so women leaders look at that and they're like, wow, that's just a lot to put on women to do that. And oh, by the way, mentoring and talent development is everybody's responsibility. All leaders are responsible for developing the talent in their charge. So again, this is why, again, we need to engage more men in, in terms of doing this. The interesting thing is that when men are doing the mentoring, we often have this notion of, of what a mentor looks like. And, and um, this is one where if we were, we were doing a presentation, I would show you this picture of the guru, what we call the guru model out there. In particular, we think we have this 
this one wise sage guru uh, mentor who's we're gonna all gonna sit at their feet and they're gonna dispense great wisdom to us and we're gonna see the golden path in front of us and life is gonna be grand out there and of course the reality is that that's not how mentoring works and we most of us recognize that well we probably have more than one mentor as well and actually the research shows that the most successful people out there have what we would call a network or a constellation of mentors, right? So you have a, a lot of mentors in different parts of your life and different parts of your career and different times of your career that are most important to who you are and what you do out there. Um, the question is, what do those mentors look like and how diverse is that network? And the same thing would go if you're a mentor, what does that look like for your mentees? Are you mentoring only people who look like you, which tends to be kind of how we, we tend to gravitate towards this if we allow it to happen very informally and kind of on a grassroots level. The last part I would leave you with is that great mentoring relationships are what we would call mutual or reciprocal in nature. And that means that there's this back and forth, there's this giving, there's a power down dynamics. You know, there's always kind of this notion that, that there's always a power dynamic in a mentoring relationship because the mentor is the, the senior person, but great mentors do a great, a really nice job of, of eliminating that or lowering that power dynamic so that there's learning and there's a give and take and there's feedback going both directions. And this is what we call reciprocity or mutuality. And the best mentoring relationships where people get the most out of them have the most mutuality and reciprocity out there. And I'll, that'll come up again as we go through this today. What's interesting is when we were doing the first research for Athena Rising, and this is prior to Me Too, was that we found, we were talking to men, there were a lot of reasons why they didn't want to be involved in these mentoring relationships with women at work. And a lot of it had to do around, uh, some of it was perceptions or biases about who women were as leaders and as workers. and you know, well, they, they might be a risky investment. She's a flight, flight risk in terms of she might go off and have babies and want to have a family and I've just wasted my time. Or, or maybe she's not tough enough or she just can't cut it, right? These negative perceptions we have about from a gendered perspective. And, and those will keep you away from, again, helping everybody out there, the, the talented folks that you see. Um, in some cases, it was more around anxiety. Sometimes men talked about the fact that, wow, you know, you know, when I was raised, I have kind of a social script for how to relate to a lot of the important women in my life and most of those family members. And, but, you know, I was never really given this kind of script of what's a close personal and developmental relationship look like with a woman at work. And so men got a little anxious about it. And what do you do when you're anxious? You avoid it, right? And that's the, we get away from that, that uncomfortability. The other one that they talked about were perceptions of their colleagues and peers and, and concern that, wow, people might start talking if, I, if I'm mentoring a woman because there might be something else going on there, And right? So we have to address some of these perception issues and why those actually might be out there in many cases. And then come about a year after the book came out, Me Too went widespread across the, the country and the world. And, you know, that... That, that really kind of changed a lot of the dynamics and men became even more anxious and more on the sidelines and avoiding uh, these relationships with women in the workplace. And there were a lot of competing um, urban myths and these, these false narratives out there about that somehow women had caused me to, it's like, nope, sorry. Um, that's a bunch of serial perpetrators and harassers and hopefully they're all going to jail right now. Um, or that, you know, somehow women suddenly are scary and dangerous and we, we shouldn't be, you know, we can't work with them. And it's like, no, no, they're really not all that scary and dangerous to work with out there. And then finally, the last one was that we see, we hear often is that somehow women are going to make these false claims around sexual harassment if you're, um, if, you know, if you're, if you're spending time with them. And again, there's zero evidence to support that whatsoever. And it usually, if you ask guys about that in particular, they'll, it'll start, it'll go along the lines of, well, I heard about a guy who, and then it goes on from there, right? And so um, we have, I think first as men, we have to push back on these narratives because they often happen in, in closed spaces where it's just men in the room and we're probably not doing this or, or saying these things around other women out there. And, and as guys, we have to begin to push back on that. And the last elephant in the room here, I'll just throw out there because we always like to have a little fun with the guys on this one in particular is that some guys are worried. It's like, well, if I get into this really kind of close personal uh, mentoring relationship with a woman, what happens if I happen to find her attractive? It's like, oh my God. Well, you know, if you happen to mentor a lot of women and work with a lot of women, it would be kind of weird if some of them weren't maybe a little bit attractive. 
Um, and, and I would say that would just be kind of odd and that, you know, from a heterosexual perspective for just a second, that um, I think you just have to acknowledge that as being somewhat normal. The question is, what do you do with it? Right. And, and this is where I think there's some great um, there's some great science out there today. And in particular, we know that men because we, we looked at I mean, all kinds of these uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging. It's great technology out there. It turns out when you look at men's brains, they have a frontal lobe. Yes, you can laugh now. And we can use that, right, to our executive decision making, right, to separate that when we feel something, it's like, well, I don't have to actually react to it. I don't actually have to act upon that, right? That we can actually use some good judgment here as we think about this from a decision-making perspective. And the last part of this is, is that we always like to remind guys that there's some great social science, social psychology research out there on, on perceived mutual attraction. And when they go out and they do this research, they go, they take groups of men and women and they ask them to rate everybody in the room on, in terms of how much they find the other person in the room attractive. And then they ask the women, ask you to rate how much you think that the other person finds you attractive. And as it turns out, there's one gender that radically overestimates how much they think the other gender finds them attractive. Yep, it's us guys. Um, so the message to guys is, is, you know, hey, she's just not that into you and get over it. So real quick, I want to I wanna give you a little bit of some uh, best practices and some things that we came up with from our research in Athena Rising around mentoring relationships and what women told us worked really well, what they most appreciated, and in some cases, what they would have liked more of, and then some of our new research around allyship. And allyship is, has two parts to it. And this is the broader idea about how we as men in particular, we show up a, in the workplace and our supportive and collaborative relationships with women and how we're in there to support gender equity and fairness in the workplace and hold ourselves accountable for that work. And then the, the harder part of that is really doing the public piece of this. And, and it's when you see others uh, and having to correct that and hold others accountable. And when you see bias in a system, and we're looking for that as well, is that we're, we're working with the organization to change the practice or to fix the process so that there isn't that bias and inequity in the system out there. So there's two parts to allyship and we'll touch on those as we go through it. So this might seem like an odd place to start, but I think Dr. Johnson Freeze hit it right, the nail right on the head today for me here on this one in particular. And that is that, hey, you know what, the best place to start on solving gender equality issues, whether you're doing it on a worldwide level or you're doing it in your organization or you're doing it in your workplace, is to start at home. And, and no better time than right now to talk about this when there, we're, all, we're all sheltered in place together in our homes and we're seeing how division of household responsibilities look right now. And it's an interesting concept because we tell men in particular that if you're going to be a, you know, an all-in ally um, in the workplace, you have to be a gender ally and gender partner at home first. You gotta be a 50-50 partner, doing your fair share and start, you can start by doing the dishes, taking the kids to the, if their practices, although they're not doing a lot of practice right now, take care of childcare, do your 50%. If you're not sure if you're doing your half, guess what? You need to go do a, just go do a real quick audit with your spouse. And when she tells you that you need to be doing more, say thank you and get busy. Um, and the flip side of this is that, it, you know, this is great, obviously, working with your partner in particular in enabling her. And if, if all men did this right, we would be enabling women out there to be doing these things. But it destigmatizes a lot of the, the uh, programs and things that are in place in the workplace. Let's say, for example, parental leave. If guys are taking this and doing their half of that, it's not a women's or gender issue anymore, a gender program out there. This is a parental program for men and women. Same thing in today's environment around telework. Uh, Finally, you know, flex work, telework, everybody's really beginning to appreciate this. Used to be stigmatized, we'll see if it is after this is all over, that this was a women's, right, a women's program. This is something for women because they need it to, to be able to take care of the kids. Guess not anymore, right? Guys are having to use it too. So really important we do this. And we do need to do this for our kids as well. Um, because guess what? We are, they're watching us and we're role modeling for them. So for dads in particular, when you're role modeling being an equal partner and you're doing, again, the, your half of the, of the uh, tasks in the household and childcare and everything else, 
your sons are watching that and they're getting a whole different perspective on what gender roles look like, both at work and at home. And guess what? When they, when they turn old enough to go out there into the workplace, they're going to take these new enlightened perspectives of what gender roles look like into the workplace and make their own change. And really important for our daughters, for, for dads out there who have daughters, guess what? The research shows us that when you're an all-in equal partner and your daughters see that when they're growing up, they're more likely to persist in their careers, attain their career goals and dreams and go into more um, less stereotypical uh, professions in industry out there and go into the ones that are more male dominated as well and be successful at it. So really important for our kids out there. So how do we get started? Guys often ask us this question. It's like, oh, you know, how do I get started with this? It seems like it, we're asking a lot. It's like, hey, this isn't that big of an ask. Um, JP Morgan Chase has a, has, a, has a program where they've asked and uh, challenged men in their company to do this 35-1 pledge. And this is 36 minutes of your day each week, uh, of your day, of your, of your week. I want you to spend 30 minutes just interacting with, with a woman, having coffee, having a conversation, getting to know her, understand the challenges she's facing in the workplace. Just again, develop awareness as, as Dr. Johnson Fries was telling us earlier. Begin to develop that awareness and understand that. Guess what, 30 minutes each week for that. Five minutes recognizing and congratulating a woman on her accomplishments and her achievements. Five minutes each week, take note. It forces you to look and take note. And then one minute talking to somebody else about her accomplishments, hopefully one of your male peers out there, right? Just again, spread this, the, uh, the same knowledge and open up that social capital and that network that you would for other guys, you do it for women as well. So 35, one, 36 minutes a week, you can start by doing this. The number one trait that women told us that they most appreciated in, um, in, their male mentors, when we did the, the research for Athena Rising, was humility. And they talked about it in terms of gender or culture hum humility and that, well, he didn't just assume that, I, he, that he knew exactly what I wanted because I was a woman or that I must need this because I'm a woman, right? That he asked questions. He had this learning orientation towards understanding my experiences that just because, you know, I was a woman and he was a man, we weren't so different that we couldn't understand each other's career goals and career dreams, but really beginning to understand that. And it's really interesting that when we look at this learning orientation, you see more of that in the reciprocal mentoring relationships around the mutuality, again, the lower power dynamics, because there, again, there's this, this in, inherent curiosity of, about learning about your, your mentee out there. And as it turns out, one of the, the takeaways we had from our research that was kind of a surprise was that we found that me male mentors with female mentees, and oh, by the way, this works the other direction too. If you're a, a, a male with a female mentor, that we find that they have a lot of benefits to this is for guys too. So there's a win for women, there's a win for your organization and a win for, for these mentors as well. And that is that, again, they have increased access to information to parts of the organization they wouldn't otherwise have, a broader network, both internal and external to the organization. And really the one we love is that they, we find that these increased and enhanced interpersonal skills. So higher EQ, higher empathy, and who doesn't want more of that in a leader in your organization? And the wonderful thing about that is that you, at the end of the day, you don't check that at the door when you go home, you get to take that home with you. And so you find that they're, they're better partners, better parents as well when they go back home. The number one skill that women told us that they most appreciated with men was listening. And we said, well, tell me more about this listening. What, what exactly are you talking about in terms of like, well, he didn't listen to try to fix a problem for me or to fix me in particular. Because um, as it turns out, it sounds like a lot of us as guys, and it's not just as men, but I think a lot of us in senior leadership positions were socialized to be problem solvers. And we pride ourselves in being great problem solvers out there. And so Mentoring can feel like that sometimes if we're not careful, right? That we're there as mentors to solve a problem. Nope, not really, right? The best things out there are really around affirmation. And, and especially if you're someone who doesn't, uh, maybe you're an underrepresented minority like a woman in a traditionally male dominated organization, sometimes you just wanna feel like you belong, that somebody didn't make a mistake and I'm not a fraud. Uh, the imposter syndrome sets in. Uh, there's all of these things that we just need affirmation that this is the right place for me and there's a, there's a future for me in this organization as well. And I'm not crazy for wanting to try to, to achieve a career in this organization. So listening skills are really important out there. So one of the things in particular we found, I'll just share this one story with you. Um, 
around assumptions in listening. And so we had the great opportunity to interview uh, Robert Lightfoot. And Robert was the NASA administrator uh, at the time. And we got to interview him because Janet Petro was one of his mentees and she was at, uh, deputy at the uh, Kennedy Space Center. And he told us that when um, he, he kind of counted himself as one of those gender savvy dudes and really kind of got it and really kind of was trying to set the example. And he was on this hiring committee at NASA and they were down to the last four candidates, very senior position there. And one was a woman and it was clear that she was the best candidate for the job. And before they were gonna make the offer, he said, you know, I just felt like I had to chime in. And so he said, here, um, this job requires a lot of travel and she just had a baby a few weeks ago, and I just, you know, I wonder if, if she's the right one for the job. And he said, fortunately for him, there was this woman on the committee who was sitting right across from him, and she was just looking at him with like flames coming out of his eyes. And, and she said, Robert, um, she's a pretty smart person. She applied for the job, and I'm pretty sure she understands that it requires a lot of travel. Um, and I'm really sure that she knows that she had a baby a few weeks ago. So why don't we let her make that decision? He was like, oh, this light bulb moment, this epiphany. And it's like, wow, here I was thinking I was this really kind of gender aware, gender savvy guy. And man, I was just stepping in it. But it really spoke to some of the humility, you know, that a lot of these male mentors shared a lot of the mistakes and the stories that uh, along the way. Uh, I'm going to share just a couple more things with you, and then I'm gonna, we'll turn it over to some Q&A here. But I, I, I do want to hit on a couple of things that I think are really important. And one in particular is around challenge when it comes to mentoring in particular. And this comes around allyship as well and how we, we perceive our mentees as being able to, again, back to perceptions about up to, the, up to the challenge, right, of handling a difficult job or something that maybe it's a little outside their, their realm. And Dr. Johnson Fries, I thought, did a nice job of, of talking about this in terms of, you know, men, we get judged and we, we look at each other in terms of, are we ready for the next job on potential? Whereas women, it's, it's back to what we call the prove it again bias around performance and that it's over and over again that women have to uh, prove themselves that they're ready for the next opportunity. And, you know, we see this in hiring, we see it in, in terms of next opportunities for jobs. And there's a, there's a job opening, you've probably seen this research where if there's eight criteria and, and you know, men will be applying for it if they meet two or three of the criteria. And there's a lot of women out there who, who probably meet seven or seven and a half parts of the criteria and, they're, and they're, they won't put their names in the hat because again, they've been socialized to, to feel like they have to prove themselves into it. And this is again, where mentors can be aware of these, again, it's kind of these socialized differences. And again, they're not for everybody, but be aware of it. And that we're providing the same kinds of challenge out there that we are uh, for men as we are for women. Um, it's really interesting. Emotions play into this too. And uh, male mentors talk to us a lot about this, about the concern about how sometimes they didn't want to stress out or challenge their mentee too much because, you know, she might, might make her cry or something like that. And, and that was another one that came up quite a bit. And, and we had a lot of great stories about that that we, I can share some other later date if we, if we have to, more time. The, um, the last thing I'll, I'll leave you with, and I think this is really important, was we had uh, the opportunity to interview Sheryl Sandberg, who's the COO of Facebook and, and wrote the book Lean In. And, you know, you know, Sheryl's been a great supporter of our work and, and she shared some really interesting stories. And one of the ones I'd like to share this last one with you is around advocacy and, and sponsorship in particular. And she said that, you know, when she graduated um, and, and, into her, and went into her first job in, in the financial industry out there, she worked, she was personal assistant for the Secretary of the Treasury at the time. And everywhere they would go, when anytime they were meeting somebody new, went into a new audience, he would always introduce Cheryl and say, hey, I want you to meet Cheryl Sandberg. She just graduated number one in economics from Harvard, and she is just a rock star. I couldn't do my job without her. And he would go on and on for a couple of minutes about how important she was and enabling him to do the work that he's doing and how important she was. And after about the third or fourth time he'd done this, Cheryl pulled him aside in private and said, said you have to stop doing that. And he's like, what, Cheryl? And he's like, well, you, you're embarrassing me every time we go out there. And he said, no, 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 this is how it works. I tell them, I open up my, again, my social capital and my network for you. 
right? And that's what I do for men. I do it for you just in the same because they need to know how much I value your work so that they're going to value it too. And it provides that opportunity, right? That, that is so important for opening doors out there. And we were just so grateful that, you know, Cheryl shared that story with us. I think it's really important that uh, we think about the advocacy component because this is the part that often gets left off as we think about how we're advancing women and others in there. So with that, I'm gonna stop because I know there's probably been a lot of great questions coming at us and we would love to field as many as we can. Well, thank you very much, uh, David and Joan. Uh, very, uh, very great uh, discussion. And we do have a number of questions, so uh, I'll start uh, sending those out to you. Uh, first, since most bias, at least in the U.S., is unconscious bias, what is the best way to address this? Joan, you want me to take that? Or? Uh, sorry, I was unmuting. There you go. Um, there's a great Harvard bias uh, kind of self test that you can do that's online and it's remarkable what you will find out about yourself. Um, one of the findings that has come out is women are most often very biased against women. Um, and that goes back to um, a, a competition between women that has been uh, written about a lot and and I think it's a great place to start this. It's called the, um, David, do you remember the exact name? If you, if you Google Harvard bias it's, test, it comes up. Yeah, it's the Implicit Association Test, yeah. IAT. Yeah, if you Google that, you'll, you'll come up with it. It's a lot of fun. It's really easy to do on your computer. And yeah. it, uh, it can be quite enlightening in it. And they have it for, it's not just for gender, but they have it for just about all sorts of dimensions of, of demographics and things you could possibly think of. Uh, some, some that I didn't even know. Do it along with your Myers-Briggs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you're right. Unconscious bias is, is something. And there's been, it, what's interesting is that we've, I think, in the, broadly in both government and the corporate world, we've dumped billions of dollars into unconscious bias training that's been done mostly in isolation. And the interesting thing about that is that the results of that, what we find are that it is not improving um, or debiasing anything or people in particular, because what we find is that over time, a one time uh, class setting does not change people's biases. It might help make them a little bit more aware. In some cases, it reinforces biases. Um, we get a negative reaction to the results of it. However, if you integrate it with leader development training or you integrate it with uh, mentoring and sponsoring uh, development and training, this is where we find we really start to begin to move the needle when it comes to diversity, inclusion, and kind of deep from a perspective of, of using that, of understanding what that bias is and how we use it. That's where we make the most gains. Great question. Thank you. Uh, next question. How effective are affinity groups? Dave, I'll let you take that. Sure. Um, so affinity groups and in the, in the corporate world, we call these employee resource groups or business resource groups. They have a lot of different names out there. And originally they were set up to, again, provide a, uh, a safe space for different underrepresented minorities out there. Uh, oh, by the way, there are a lot of these today that are for military veterans out there. Uh, I've worked with a lot of them. Um, and, but they're out there to provide a safe place to share experiences and best practices and help and provide resources and affirmation, all sorts of things, you know, mentoring and sponsoring is just part of it as well. So I think those are, they're, they're really valuable. And I think we're seeing a proliferation of them um, across industries out there today. Um, what we see though also is a movement away from doing them in isolation and trying to find different ways to connect them. So this is kind of a best practice over the last few years. In particular, if we talk about gender, um, we're finding over the last two years now more groups that are trying to integrate a kind of an adjunct group around male allies. And so men as allies, uh, again, because it takes a little bit of a gender integration here is we're going to move the dial um, on, on really reducing a lot of the inequities because we need to have men in the conversation as well. It's a leadership issue, not a women's issue. But at the same time, I think it's important that um, these different affinity groups have a place where they can, again, they can go in a safe space to share experiences and to talk about things that maybe they don't want to share in front of their other colleagues 
out there, but I think more and more as we begin to uh, understand the importance of, of integrating the conversation with others, um, a lot of these affinity groups are, are, are really connecting with each other and doing a lot of great work around allies in particular. I, if I could just add on to that, um, it's important, it's so important to have men working with women on gender equality. There's groups, he for she and others. Um, I can't say men think they are more attractive than they really are. David can say that. Um, there's a lot of things that we really need to expand uh, the idea that women, peace and security, gender equality, is, that it's all women talking about it. Unfortunately, today, what we often see is that when uh, when groups are set up to discuss these issues, it is all women. So the more men we can ally with, the more we can uh, broaden the idea that these aren't women's issues. There's groups working on nuclear strategy, on space security, that to to point out what women bring to the field and it's best done, as David said, when men say, yes, they are very valuable. That often uh, is where you can overcome this, the gender tax. The uh, next one is a question that's uh, very practical in nature. And it basically says, if I'm uh, going before a hiring panel, usually composed primarily of men, how do I prove that I'm competent without being seen as overly aggressive or braggadocious? That is the $64,000 question for every woman. Uh, it is, it's, it's the hard line to walk. Um, you know, there's no magic answer to that. You just have to, you have to be competent, confident. But I will tell you, if there is bias lurking, it will come out. I once applied for a job and was told that the hiring committee thought I was by far the most qualified, but they just didn't like me. That's very often women find they can be competent or likable, but not both. Um, so I think you just have to put your credentials forward. And I, a, a colleague of mine once put it, unfortunately, a lot of times women have to mommy their male colleagues in terms of um, a woman can say something and it will be ignored and the person sitting, the man sitting next door to a meeting will say the same thing and it's a suddenly a brilliant idea. Um, and that requires, again, uh, not being seen as too aggressive. As you might say, oh, Professor Jackson, have you thought of it this way? Or that's a great thought, Professor Jackson. How about if we look at it uh, from another perspective? It's a skill that women learn. Unfortunately, we've had to learn um, to get your perspective considered, but not be seen as pushy. Can I, um, I'm gonna, can I offer a, a privileged answer as, as the, the middle-aged, white, straight, married male here in the group? Um, why would you want to work for an organization like that? Because clearly they don't value gen diversity or gender diversity in particular. So, um, that, again, a very privileged response there to say that. And, and in particular, you know, for people who, who need the job, um, you know, that's easy for me to say at that point. But um, what I would say is that, we have to back that up a couple of steps. And again, we're, we're focusing this again on, on the person who is applying. And I go, well, the process is broken because one, the applicant was the applicant pool. Was it balanced to begin with? Why is there only a group of men in the interview panel? There should be a, again, a balance of, of people in the panel itself that are doing the interviewing and the process in, in particular. And so, and I think this is the question that a lot of organizations today are starting to wrestle with is how do we begin to de-bias, right? How do we look for the inequities within the system, right? That we're recreating, because guess what? If you have a panel of just men, the odds are they're going to, they're going to pick somebody who looks just like them. Right? Ducks pick ducks. Exactly. And so we have to, we have to take a step back and, and I feel like this is, this is kind of victim blaming almost, right? Because we're back to, well, how do women, how do you self pretzel so that you can get picked for the job? It's like, well, why should I, why do I want to be in that job to begin with? Why do I want to be in that organization to begin with? Why doesn't the organization, you know, fix their process? So anyway, that, that may not be the response you were looking for. Uh, Dave, there's another question here that says, uh, do you say these same things to groups of men 
or is it only when you're asked about a women's issue that you get to say it? Or do you have opportunities to get men together and tell this story? Great question. Um, and so the answer is that in all the speaking, you know, that we get to do in, in addressing different organizations and groups out there, again, our messaging and, and our books and everything that we write about is, is targeted at men. And we don't get as many opportunities to get all male audiences, usually more mixed gender audiences. Um, and then, you know, of course, there's been a lot of female audiences as well. Um, I can tell you that I can remember early on, though, I had the opportunity to address every CO, every commanding officer of every aviation squadron in, in the United States. So, and which, oh, by the way, the, the first group of them, there was 150 and there were five women out of the 150 there. So it was all men out there. And so they got all of the, they get the exact same messaging. Um, we can have a, sometimes a little different conversation with the guys in, in particular. And we tend to, again, we'll target our, um, our particular audience out there with this, but, but yeah, our, our messaging is designed and the way we write, if you ever get a chance to read any of our books, um, you'll see the messaging there is directed specifically at men. There's a question about uh, the danger of some sort of gender equality being forced on an organization and might potentially result in not the best quality candidate getting the job. Is that an issue that you've seen and is that something we should be careful about? I think that's basically talking about quotas and whether it's at a national level or an organizational level, quotas are often uh, adopted as basically an affirmative action to get enough women into an organization where they have, where there's inclusivity, where, where they have uh, a voice and they feel um, free to speak up without fear of retribution. Um, and that, that is usually 30%. So companies, countries have often adopted quotas to get enough women in, and then they will pull back on the quota. But it's, it's often the only way you can uh, get women in at more than a token level, um, where they are, are, are free to go into a meeting and voice their opinion and basically um, sometimes play hardball without feeling that they will pay a price for it. So I, I think it, the idea of looking at it as forced gender equity, forced gender equality, is basically arguing for getting over the cultural biases, which may preclude women getting women into positions naturally. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, people have a lot of negative perceptions, both men and women, about quotas in particular. Um, for, again, those same reasons, the perception that we're going to end up with Nobody wants to be that person who, who is the quota. And, and certainly there's the perception that we, we were lowering our standards out there. Reality is that the research shows that quotas do work, by the way. Um, and they, they do help us to overcome some of the cultural and social biases and, and challenges that we have. And, and, and rec once you get over those, then, then you can remove the quotas and things tend to work just fine on their own. Um, the reality is also is that targets or goals, which are a softer way, if you think about it, kind of a softened way to think about what quotas are, actually work a little bit better. Um, and, and again, this is not just in the United States. They've actually been tested more often in other countries outside the U.S. Uh, California today is probably one of the few places that's, uh, that, you know, that has uh, approved a, a quota system in particular for the state. Um, it was just in the in the news again the other day. We were talking about this about how the effects of it around uh, directors and, and board membership in particular. But it it forces companies or organizations to begin to think about all right. Well, how can I if I'm trying to increase my, my board membership, uh, my diversity in there? What are the things that I can do to help do that? And it, you can get into start learn, learning about the best practices of how this works. And and that's I think where we begin to change the process and and the system itself. Well, I think that's been a, a wonderful discussion, and I thank both of our speakers for being here this afternoon and uh, sharing these thoughts with us, and hopefully it generates more uh, impact on the organization going forward. So uh, I, my thanks to them. I will uh, mention to the audience at large that uh, next week on the 5th of May, 
we'll be hearing from Dr. Jim Holmes, who'll be talking about U.S. naval power in the Pacific. So thank you very much.